So if you've not come across this game before, it's basically like a post-post-apocalyptic survival simulator in which all living animals, or almost all living animals, have been wiped out and outcompeted by these weird mechanical replacements, these robotic creatures. Which is such a fascinating concept, especially to a paleontologist. I'm like so intrigued by how these creatures work and how they're sort of evolved and how they sort of fit into this ecosystem. It's really cool. But on top of that, the vast majority of the robots in the game are sort of based on, or at least inspired by, dinosaurs and other ancient animals. I think it's just around this corner. Yeah, you can just about see it through the sand. Let's see how close we can get to it. Without it absolutely killing us. Oh god. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually going to help, but... So yeah, as you can see, <laughs> some of the robots in this game are pretty clearly based on dinosaurs and, as we'll see soon, other ancient animals. This one is called the Thunder Jaw, because of course it is, and looking at its sort of legs and its tail, it's very clearly based on like a large theropod dinosaur, almost certainly a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Something that I find really interesting about the way it's sort of depicted in this game, let's see if we can get a little bit closer, is that it has no forearms, so obviously Tyrannosaurus has very tiny forearms and it's often made fun of, but it's really interesting because early Tyrannosaurus actually had quite long forearms and then over the course of about 90 million years or so they gradually became reduced, so maybe the developers of this game assumed that- oh god, <laughs> maybe the developers of this game assumed- that's terrifying- Maybe they assumed that uh, Tyrannosaurus arms were sort of these useless vestigial features that if they were still around today, maybe the next logical step would be their, you know, loss completely, as is shown here. But that's not really the case. Despite their arms being quite small, they may have still used them in sort of holding down prey or potentially holding on to their mates, which I'm not going to get massively into. You can sort of look that up yourself if you're, if you're particularly interested in it. But the main reason why I wanted to talk about the game on this channel is that a lot of the animals, even though they're sort of very scary stylized robots, I mean look at this one, it's got like a gun in its head, oh my god, it's so... They, as you can see by my reaction, they actually do feel big and heavy and like real li living animals, I mean they do kind of follow a repeated path, but if you kind of watch them for long enough as we're going to do throughout this video, You'll see them kind of grazing and hunting and exhibiting very naturalistic behaviours. And our role as the player is to either watch them from behind a rock, which I'm doing quite well at this point, or you can very carefully hunt them. If you have the right equipment. <laughs> um, and I think that's really interesting. Our objective as a player is not to just gun them down on sight, as is usually the case in uh, most dinosaur-inspired uh, or games including dinosaurs. And... I think that's really interesting. Alright, well, I think the best thing we can do is just kind of get a move on and leave this thing in peace because it will almost certainly kill me. Oh god, oh god, no, 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 it's gone horribly wrong. And these next ones are really interesting. So they're called the Scrappers, and their job is basically to go around and sort of scavenge on the remains of all the other robots, which brings up so many questions about how these robots work. Um, but anyway, I think their appearance and behaviour is very clearly inspired by hyenas. So if you look closely, uh, the jaws have these like massive saw blades, which it kind of uses to like slice open the other machines, which is it's actually pretty appropriate because living hyenas are some of the few living animals with teeth and jaws powerful enough to break and eat uh, bone. <laughs> And I bring them up in this video because the paleontology of hyenas is really interesting and really underappreciated. Fossils of hyenas have been found all across Europe. In fact, hyenas actually made the journey from Africa to the UK, like, before humans did? But the most commonly found fossil is actually their fossil dung, which we call uh, coprolites. And yeah, if you ever stumble across, like, I don't know, like a, a fossil mammoth or a fossil woolly rhino or something like that, you're bound to find hyena coprolites all around it. So I'm just waiting um, for the sun to rise before I film this next section, cause, just because it looks a bit better. And I just noticed there's a little fox just kind of hanging out and, oh, what's that? That's a little raccoon. Uh, that's really interesting. And oh, it's gone now, of course, but I just wanted to mention something that I hadn't really thought about until this moment. Um, not all of the animals have been replaced by the robots, and in fact there are quite a few 
living animals wandering around. There's a fox, there's a raccoon, I've seen rabbits, uh, wild boars as well are very common. And that is just such a great detail. Because I mean, we arbitrarily divide animals into two categories. We have specialists and we have generalists. Specialists have evolved to suit a very specific, very specialized lifestyle. They can only eat specific food or survive in a certain climate. And in the wake of a mass extinction, which has completely altered the environment, they're usually the first to die out. Generalists that are sort of easy going with whatever and more sort of independent, um, they're more likely to survive. So it makes sense that wild boars and raccoons and foxes and rabbits are still kicking around in this future. Anyway, the sun is coming up. <laughs> Let's look at some interesting creatures and already I can see heaps of them. So frustratingly, there isn't a lot of long grass nearby for us to hide in. Let's just very carefully skirt along the riverbanks. So to start off with, we've got this one, which is called the Long Leg, because I guess it does have long legs. Um, oh god. Jesus Christ, that scared me so much. Um, anyway, so you're probably expecting me to say it looks like um, another dinosaur, but it actually reminds me more of a group of animals called the Forest Rockidae, which are an extinct group of giant carnivorous flightless birds, uh, more commonly known as the terror birds that dominated South America five million years ago. And like the long leg, terror birds had very powerful muscular legs, suggesting that they could sort of easily kick and pin down their prey. It's now understood that terror birds died out due to habitat loss associated with the uh, most recent ice age. But for many years, it was assumed that they were outcompeted by the emergence of much larger predatory mammals like the saber-toothed cats, which I think, uh, if we go to the river, we'll see something very similar to that. Um, I want to talk about these things. They're called grazers, and they're probably my favorite creature in the game, despite being found pretty much everywhere. As a paleontologist, I find all the creatures in this game really interesting because I want to know how they work. And the grazers very subtly convey early on that, oh, they actually do need to eat to survive. If you kind of leave them alone like we're doing now, you can actually see them sort of grazing away at the soil and the grass. Do you mind? Presumably to get nutrients from it, which I think goes in those little tanks on their back, potentially. It's, um, it's really interesting. And I just love the idea of, like, a lawnmower <laughs> convergently evolving into, well, I guess they're very clearly meant to look like deer, aren't they? Or rather, cervidae, which is the sort of family of deer, uh, the family of animals that includes deer and moose and elk, I should say. And the reason why I'm including them in this video is because of their huge size. They actually remind me of Megaloceros. Megaloceros is an extinct, gigantic deer that lived during the last ice age all across Europe and Siberia. And and I find them really interesting because of the ways that we do and don't understand them, if that makes sense. So for instance, we know what colour they were because we have cave art of them, which is really cool. But then at the same time, we don't really understand how they went extinct yet. There was a long-standing theory that their antlers just became too big for the emergence of sort of forests at the end of the Ice Age. It's probably more accurate to say that the environmental changes could no longer support their very nutrient-rich diet that they needed to just stay at that same size and sort of support these massive antlers as well. All right, now I'm actually gonna, because I really wanted you to see how big these things are, I'm gonna run right up to them. It's probably gonna kill us, but I need you to see just how colossal they are so you can get a sense of how big my Galoceros was. All right, here we go. Dun, 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 dun. So, <laughs> scale. Okay, run. <laughs> I really scared them all off. Okay. Once again, we do the old song and dance of trying to find a good place to hide. Hi, please don't kill me. I am just looking at you. I'm not here to kill you today. Okie dokie then. So, okay, now I'm actually here. I haven't really got a lot to say about them. As you can see, they've got a sharp teeth. They're very clearly based on Sibiju so cats, such as Smilodon. Uh, of course, they're a lot bigger. And um, we've, we've talked before as well about how the name Saber Toothed Cat isn't really accurate or used by paleontologists outside of science communication at all. They were only distantly related to modern big cats, instead belonging to their own group of felids called the, uh, the Machairodon today. I was hoping that it would be more apparent from this distance, but you can't quite see their little fangs. Here is my grand plan. Hiya! Oh jeez. Okay. Run, 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 run. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? Alright, it's still early morning. I think 
what we need to do now is just sort of head downstream for the next thing I want to show you. And try not to die along the way. I can see what we're looking for in the distance. <laughs> What's the phrase? Like, out of the frying pan into the fire? So these ones are called snap maws. They're clearly massive crocodiles, which puts me in mind of all sorts of extinct giant crocodile ancestors and relatives. The question is, which one? There's this weird quirk of sort of convergent evolution where a crocodile-like body plan seems to be one of those things that it just keeps coming back to. A friend of mine, Dr. Andy Jones, did his PhD on a group of reptiles called phytosaurs, but there are loads of extinct crocodile-like reptiles just like them. I showed him a picture of the snap maw the other day, and he thinks it was probably based on fossils of Saracosuchus imperator. Yes, another separate croc-like reptile, only this one could grow over like nine meters in length. Something that Andy noticed about them is that they've got, if you look at the tips of their noses, it's sort of got that hook sort of, whoa, oh, showing it off me perfectly there, that sort of, whoa, please don't kill me, oh my god, this sort of hooked, downturned snout, <laughs> a sort of hooked, downturned snout, which you can see here, this is a great way to look at them, um, Anyway, animals with this kind of jaw tend to have a vesivorous diet, which basically just means that they eat fish. We see it in things like alligator gars, spinosaurs, and of course, obviously, crocodiles and their distant relatives. But, um, oh, there it goes. Please. Yep, I thought so. I knew that was going to be it. I knew. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> They're actually doing pretty well on land as well, which is quite cool. They remind me of, I think there's a group of crocodiles called the Plenocranidae. I think that's right. Again, I say crocodiles, distant relative of crocodiles. Um, and they would actually spend quite a lot of their time on land, if, if not. I hate this game. I'm just looking at my map real quick. So as you can see, this is kind of where I was playing the game properly and then I sort of went off on a little voyage. Just, this is the route I knew I could take where I could find all the creatures that I wanted to talk to you about. We've been mostly running around here. What I would like to try and do is get to this thing. I'll be honest, I actually kind of fell out of this game. I thought it was quite boring at first, but then after doing this walk... Oh look, it's more of our good friends. Right, just get onto this bit of rock. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> oh my god, I completely forgot about these ones. Um, one second. Oh man, okay, so these are the Watchers. They're actually one of the first creatures that you actually encounter in the game. They're very common, and I completely forgot about them. There's not really a lot to say that hasn't already been said before, but they're again very clearly inspired by theropod dinosaurs. They've got two little legs, long, uh, long tail, and... Again, no um, forearms as well, which I find so fascinating. They're a little bit smaller than the uh, Thunderjaw, I guess, so they're probably based more on sort of raptors. Um, maybe something like... Uh, I don't know, maybe like a Deinonychus or something? It's not quite right. There's not really anything... It's They have really weird proportions, where they've got really thin little legs and then a massive like head. Yeah, look at that. That's, that's such a weird thing. So I guess they're somewhat theropod-like, but not really. This looks like a perfect route for us. And I'm hoping that when we get to the crest of this little hill, as the sun shines down upon us. Here we go again. There it is. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I guess the, the what are they called again? Ravages. I guess I hadn't really, that's just seen me, hasn't it? Yep, okay. All right, come on then. Oh, there's loads of them. The danger with this game is that they put all the animals so close together that you run from one directly into another one. I, I hadn't really prepared anything to say about these guys. They're sort of, um, I guess they're sort of more wolf-like, aren't they, the Ravagers? Um, maybe like a dire wolf? Oh my god, it's like alerting everything, like, oh good. Um, yeah, dire wolves are actually like a real thing that live during the Ice Age. They're giant wolves. Actually, they're not very closely related to wolves. Like, like saber tooths, they're not giant cats. They're their own separate lineage that just look like cats because they have a very similar lifestyle. They sort of converged on, on that sort of wolf-like shape here. Much like the robots have done, they've also converged on the shape of giant wolves. Yeah, I guess the idea of the dire wolves is that they went extinct because of their, their prey went extinct. They were built to hunt massive creatures in the Ice Age, massive mammalian megafauna as they died out. They also died out, whereas wolves, like grey wolves for instance, live in North America today, they carried on because they, you know, were still well suited to their environment. 
But yeah, um, I don't really want to tangle with these things right now. Nor do I want to... What the heck is that thing? It's a glint hawk. And then we've got tramplers. I'm not even... I've not been to this part of the map before, so I don't know what the tramplers are. I'm going to put my head over the top. See what I think. They kind of look like uh, bison. They've got that sort of hump to their back, don't they? And they're grazing like the other ones did, like the like the grazers do. Yeah, they're definitely bison-like, aren't they? Or buffalo-like, uh, I should say. Whichever you prefer, I think is fine. Oh, the sun setting is... <laughs> Maybe we'll wait here for the sun to rise again? That might be smart. Alright, so the sun is just rising and kind of suddenly realising just how dangerous this area actually is. Actually, that long grass over there, it's perfect. First time I saw this in the game, it was... Right, look, please, just, 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 right. Just let me do this, okay? Just for five minutes, just stand still. Now, you could argue that this is clearly based on a giraffe because it hasn't got a long tail. It, its posture is more giraffe-like. But it's got a long neck, and obviously we're going to talk about sauropods because... Well, look at it. It's so sauropod-like. Especially on account of it being huge, and that's really what I want to talk about. It doesn't really notice us, nor does it seem to care. Nor do any of the creatures around here seem to care, and that's pretty appropriate. You often find that the largest uh, animals tend to just be ignored by even the largest predators. It's often misreported that sauropods grew so big because they were trying to stay ahead of their predators, but it's actually the other way around. Sauropods would grow and the predators would kind of grow to keep up with them, and that's why they're always sort of one step behind, if that makes sense. No, sauropods were able to get to the size that they did because of all sorts of evolutionary adaptations that allowed them to maximize their energy efficiency. So for instance, they had hollow bones, much like living birds do today. Hollow bones means you have a much lighter skeleton. I think I said this in the Animal Crossing video. If you were to scale yourself to the size of a sauropod, you would just die instantly. Your bones would just collapse under their own weight. But dinosaurs and therefore birds have the advantage in that their bones are just naturally lighter. Sauropods also, unlike this one, that looks like the uh, Starship Enterprise, had really little heads, which is, again, makes them very easy to move around. And that's the crux of it. The long neck doesn't just increase their reach, it essentially allows them to plant their feet where they are and then just move their head and their neck around, grazing around, swooping it around, eating what they want, and basically costs very little energy-wise for them to eat, which is really interesting. There's literally one of every kind here. I could have done the whole video in this desert. <laughs> uh, let's just hop up here. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, do you know what really annoys me? Jeez is that they actually look very Spinosaurus-like, I've just realised. They've got that sort of, look at their like long nose. Yeah, and I guess from side on they kind of have a sail, and the, the barrel would sort of serve as a sail. I guess? Yeah, I can kind of see it. But I'm not talking about uh, Spinosaurus anymore, because as soon as I do it, a new paper comes out uh, that changes it, so... I'm kind of sick to death of them, to be honest with you. Okay, so we've changed the uh, scenery up a bit. We've gone back to the nice snowy mountains. I figured I figured we could do with a change in scenery anyway. The game's other major paleontological theme is the Anthropocene. So as you probably know, geologists and paleontologists divide deep time up into different stages and different epochs, different eras. And they're usually defined by something like a mass extinction or something else that's sort of easily traceable in the rock records. So something you'd be able to find easily all around the world. So for example, the late Cretaceous Epoch ends 66 million years ago when the asteroid lands, for example. But that begs the question, what epoch are we in now, and when did it begin? Well technically we're in the Holocene, which started around 12,000 years ago, but there's also a widespread belief among a lot of Earth's- Ah, there, here it is, this is what I was looking for. There's a, there's a widespread belief that we are now in what we could consider the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene will be defined by the time in which human activity has been the dominant driving force in global climate and ecology. If, say, for instance, a hypothetical future paleontologist like ourselves were to explore this place, what evidence would we find of human activity, or more accurately, rampant capitalism, would we find in the sedimentary record? For instance, I had a bit of a sort of spooky moment when I was kind of exploring this game and realised that these weird boulders 
are actually the long dead rotting remains of cars and this rock here is clearly like a piece of a building like it's got like the sort of support structures in it but it has since been rendered almost unrecognizable over time that is a ridiculously interesting topic for a video game to explore and yeah i really want to talk about it so horizon zero dawn takes place roughly i think about a thousand years in the future which as a paleontologist is kind of nothing and yeah you can see over here we've got the kind of skeletal infrastructure the sort of you know remains of some buildings which is really cool we've got like traffic lights and stuff like that and i love imagining what it would be like to be a character like um like alloy our main character here what it would be like exploring a place like this without knowing what it represents it's really 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 cool so while we sort of wander around this place and have a bit of an explore let's ask ourselves and this is kind of the big problem with the idea of the anthropocene when does it begin because no one can really quite agree on it does it start in the Industrial Revolution, for instance, the time when we began releasing uh, massive amounts of CO2? Or does it begin with the first ever atomic bomb? So radioactive dating, like uh, carbon dating, for instance, these methods aren't actually reliable for anything younger than 70 years or so because of how messy the planet has become thanks to all the nuclear testing that we've done on it does it begin when uh, plastic enters the geological system yeah does it start there does it start when we find like you know bits of lego in a river <laughs> is that the beginning of the anthropocene finding a very multicolored layer in the sediment of uh, different colored plastics that haven't broken down yet oh does it begin <laughs> oh my god oh hi Oh my god, yeah, I totally forgot that you were here. Um, how's it going? Well, this is a much more peaceful place to do this, I guess, isn't it? Um, we could theoretically get on this one and ride it around for a bit. Or does it start with, like, the onset of um, colonialism? The kind of homogenization of things like, um, uh, like livestock and crops and things like that. You know, if you were a paleontologist in the future looking at the fossil record in Australia, you would find all these crazy, like, massive marsupials, and then one day just, oh, rabbits are just everywhere now, like, overnight. You know, these changes that happen so quickly. Can we jump onto you here? Uh, yay! Okay, <laughs> just go for a bit of a climb. Or does it begin thousands of years ago when our ancestors began wiping out all of the uh sort of oh god all the big like ice age mammals and things i have no idea and that's kind of the the problem with there we go hey perhaps the scariest thought though is that um the anthropocene hasn't even started yet and we're actually bound to do something even worse <laughs> in the next few years that like we're like okay everything else doesn't count until this point because this was so horrific Oh, imagine finding another planet in the solar system that also had an Anthropocene. Like, you're going back to the sedimentary record and you found this sort of grey line in the rock from like, okay, there were, you know, people here. I think as a species, we're kind of very intrigued about kind of what would happen, these kind of things. Oh, at least I am, I don't know, maybe you are or not. If, if, if you are intrigued by this, when do you think the Anthropocene would start? That's kind of your, your question for the comment section, I guess. All right, thanks for the lift. I'm going to leave you now. Oh, no, I've landed in like, the most stupid place. There we, there we go. Anyway, I think we're going to call it a day there. I have no idea how I'm going to edit this video. It was so chaotic in the end. Just so many, like, unexpected things. Oh, god damn it. So many unexpected things just kept happening. So, um, not sure how this video is going to turn out, but I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, if you have any other games that you would like to see us take a look at, just leave a comment. We're bound to get to them eventually. We've got so many left to do, and I will see you next time.